Welcome to the Mental Advantage Podcast. Whether you're an athlete trying to perform at your best when it counts the most, a coach or business leader trying to get more out of your team, or someone looking for more personal growth, this is the place for you. This podcast is your map to guide you to the right mindset, systems, and strategies you need to become the best version of yourself. And now, here's John Cullen and Brandon Allen. So I want, I, I want to make sure that we talk to him about the article that to- was telling you about in the SI article. The SI article. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where I he's mean, so ranking, funny about he's, first pitches. and <laughs> He ranks the presidents of the United States uh, in their first pitches. From, yeah, yeah, he does his top five, which is hilarious. He's, he's, he's going to be a good one for, uh, for the listeners and, 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 Picking his brain a little bit, you talk about those are stressful pitches. I know you and I were talking about something that you had you had heard or read about uh, stress pitches and and what that. Yeah. So first of all, guys, uh, welcome to the show tonight. Uh, We're talking Brandon and I about Bob Tewksbury, who's our guest, uh, who's going to be really great. Uh, I'll save the introduction to the actual interview, so you don't have to hear it twice. But Bob is a former major league pitcher who um, got involved in, uh, you know, got his master's in sports psychology and counseling and also got involved as a mental skills coach in the majors for the Red Sox and the Giants and the Cubs. So really good stuff you'll hear from him tonight. But Brandon and I were just talking there about and we we do talk to Bob about this is stress pitches and how so many times you see these pitchers who come in and they do their job to get out of a jam. And next thing you know, you're like, Oh, he's done. You know, you always want to stand up standing ovation for the guy. And like, it's a big finale kind of a thing. Like, you know, cheers, kudos, great job. And then next thing you know, the guy comes walking back out and you're like, what, what, what are we doing? What, well, what? And, it, and it erodes confidence. I mean, you, you, you as a coach can, you have the ability to end something on a high so that, he can he can build on that success and then and then you 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 decide not to do that which as a coach you know our our job is to is to put players in a in a, the best position to succeed absolutely right and and when you do something like you're talking about it it certainly doesn't do that um, I, I'm a big fan of even ending practice I, yes I don't care I don't care if it's ten or fifteen minutes early. If something great just happened, um, and, and this is really probably more applicable, like in, in the football setting than baseball, but if something great just happened, hey yeah. man, we done. Yeah. Get it up. Let's take it. Let's cut to the hut on that one. Like yeah. that was. We're, we're ending it. I, I think you need to always try to end it on that. I think, especially when you're dealing with young players, you know, whether that be young, uh, you know travel ball players, high school players, whatever the case may be. I mean, there is such a lesson to be learned in that is just knowing when to say when and, and just let's, okay. Everybody feels good. They, there's nothing you're going to gain by that additional 10 minutes of like opening some other thing up that That may or may not end. Right. That next rep of muscle memory isn't worth what you just accomplished in confidence. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, it, yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. And I think, I think Bob, Bob is a, uh, uh, is going to be a great guest for everybody to listen to. Cause I know he touches on confidence as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I think it's going to be great. For, uh, Good deal. For Enjoy Bob Tewksbury. Well, we have a great guest on the show this evening with Bob Tewksbury. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Bob and his career in the major league. So he's drafted in 1981 by the New York Yankees, played 18 seasons of professional ball, 13 of which was in the bigs with six different teams. Yankees, Cubs, Cardinals, Rangers, Padres, and Twins was an all-star in 1992. Pretty good year here, Brandon. Sixteen and five on the season, a two point one six ERA and a hundred or two hundred thirty three innings. And uh, actually, this is—I remember watching this game. Bob is in nineteen ninety eight. 
he's pitching for the twins and he famously threw Mark oh, the McGuire, the Ethan <laughs> pitches. Yeah. You were got, watching that. I huh? was watching that game. It got him to ground out and pop out. And, uh, and here, here's one of these And Bob. I know you probably get tired of hearing some of these things, but he's the second lowest ratio of base on balls per innings pitch for any starting pitcher to pitch in the major league since the 1920s. Now That's you got to go back. No, I never bit. get tired of hearing that because, uh, <laughs> That, yeah, I think that people can appreciate the art of that, and that's something I'm really proud of. I spent a lot of time practicing that art, yeah. and so thanks for uh, absolutely recognizing yeah. that. Yeah, you uh, and 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 also uh, so after retiring from the game, Bob went back to school and got his master's degree in sports psychology and counseling from Boston University, and became a mental skills coach uh, as well as a, a sports psychologist. But he's worked with the Boston Red Sox in that capacity, San Francisco Giants and Chicago Cubs, and is now working independently with clients from, uh, you know, the, and also is a co-author of the book, 90% Mental, which I read this week and is an outstanding book. Oh, really, thank you. Yeah, yeah. He co-wrote that book with Scott Miller. We, we got to make sure we give Scott some credit for that as well. But Welcome. No, to the, don't yeah. give him any credit. <laughs> he gets enough. I, I, you know, I call him scribe. He, he, we refer to each other as he refers to me as retired pitcher, and I, I refer to him as scribe. And uh, <laughs> no, I. It's funny. I just talked to the our agent and the book uh, editor via email the other day, and I said I asked him how many books we sold, and he hadn't got back to me yet. And I said, no matter the number, it would have been a lot better if you could have got a better writer. Uh, <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's <laughs> John, I want to correct you on one thing because yes, it is sir. important. I'm not a sports psychologist. Um, and there's a distinction, you know, having a PhD in the field allows you. Ken Revisa was a sports psychologist. I believe Brett McCabe uh, has yeah, a clinical right. degree in psycho. And so I am a, you know, I have a master's degree. Uh, I'll fully admit I have a PhD in pitching, maybe two PhDs. Oh yeah, but I am a master's in sports psychology and counseling. So no, that that's great, and, and thanks for that clarification because I think right now we're starting to see these lines get blurred a little bit, right? Yeah, Over, you know, so many people uh, getting into mental skills, mental performance coaching, and sports psychology, and everything else. So let's start there. I think it's a good segue into what made you decide after your playing days to go back to school and get that master's degree and ultimately get into mental skills coaching and kind of going down that path. Yeah, I had no idea, John, what I was going to do. I, I knew that uh, at that point in my career, I had um, you know accomplished my goals. I had a hundred over a hundred wins. I had ten years in the big leagues, um, but I you know been. Uh, the last uh, eight years of that were post-surgery and a lot of work to stay healthy and then a young family and traveling and being away. And so um, I left on my terms and I had no idea what I was going to do other than finish my undergrad degree, uh, which was from St. Leo College, now St. Leo University, in physical education. So I, I did that. And um the Red Sox hired me as a as a pitching consultant. They wanted me to be a pitching coach in A ball, but I didn't. You know, I, I wanted. To, and one of the reasons I retired is because I wanted to get away from the game. I certainly wasn't going to do it on the salary of an A ball pitching coach. When I got to play it another year. Um, so I um, so I went back to school and finished that. And um, it was during my time in that role that I met. Uh, actually, Doug Gardner, um, he's a sports psychologist. He was working for the Red Sox um, kind of loosely at the time. This would have been 1999. So sports psych was just kind of coming in, you know, the decade before with Harvey Dorfman and Ken Revisa and <clears throat> Charlie Mayer. Um, so anyway, I met Doug and he had the degree in sports psychology from BU and and I thought, hmm, you know, maybe I could carve out my own niche here if I have a, you know, a former player with a, you know, a good career um, with a master's degree. And but it took me three years to pull a trigger on that. So I finally 
did it in 2003 and graduated in 04. So I had no idea what I was going to do. It was just kind of, I didn't want to coach. I, I wanted to be involved in the game, but be home. Uh, you know, like Brandon just had practice with his, his 13U team. And I was able to coach my son's little league team, his Babe Ruth league team, and uh, actually helped through high school and then into college. So those times are really, really important. And um, yeah. so anyway, and the Red Sox hired me in 04 to start their mental skills program formally and um, kind of took off from there. You know, it's interesting. You say something in the book that Brandon and I have been talking a lot about recently is, you know, early on in your career, back when like Whitey Herzog and Sparky, you know, Captain Hook, of course, with the Reds and Stump Merrill are sitting in these big league dugouts, you say, if you asked to see the mental skills coach, they're, they're putting you on a bus. Like you're, <laughs> you're done. Right. I mean, that, that wasn't yeah. a conversation you just brought up. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, I played for stump and I love stump. He, uh, I played for him in the Florida state league and, um, yeah, he probably would have said that, you know, he's from Maine. He's not far from here actually, as we record this, but yeah, you just, you know, I mean, I have a story my wife, we were dating at the time she was working as the uh, assistant to the president of a hospital and big job had, had an MBA was just kind of, um, you know, very communicative in that business. So I had a bad game and she was visiting in New York and I was, you know, lamenting to her and she goes, well, just go talk to the manager. I'm like, are you out of your mind? I'm going to go talk to the manager about this stuff. There's no way. So, um, no, it wasn't something that you shared, uh, openly with anybody. Yeah. Did you have guys, Bob, on your teams? Did you recognize as you kind of look back, were there anybody that was exceptionally good at the mental game or playing pitch to pitch that you played with that were teammates? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, I can say that I was fortunate enough to play with, uh, a lot of Hall of Fame players, mm -hmm. um, Dave Winfield, Ricky Henderson, um, Trevor Hoffman, Tony Gwynn, Ryan Sandberg, um, boy, uh, Ozzy Smith, Lee Smith. Um, and, you know, there's something that separates those great players that um, from the ordinary guys because they do it over a length of time. Um, you know, my rookie year, I was really impressed with with Don Mattingly's approach, you know, and barring a back injury. I mean, he was a great player and tenacious, never gave away an at-bat, um, focused on what was going on. And, um, and I remember one day having a talk with him about goal setting and and he said, you know, he really didn't set goals because he didn't want to live in himself, which was really interesting you know that now the literature and goal setting is you know you, you make goals but they're adjustable and you can move them up and down but you know this that was at old tiger stadium i'll never forget it in detroit and um so i just thought that was really interesting concept and that just shows you that he was not going to limit himself to what he could achieve so there were a lot of players john that i think really did that um uh over time and that's what made them successful yeah so so how did you approach it because i mean certainly first of all the fact that the that you got that number of wins um and you made it through an error bob that wore the powder blues right so um uh, <laughs> it's good to see those making a making a i know return, i love right? those yeah yeah me too me too i'm glad to see them back um but but do you look back kind of along the same vein of, of John's question and go, you know, we didn't know it was maybe, maybe mental performance at the time, but these are some of the things that, that I remember doing as a player. Um, yeah, I, I think I definitely did. Um, you know, so in, well, I know I could have used someone like me when I was in New York for sure. Um, right. That was tough. You know, the newspapers and, you know, every day your feet hit the ground in New York, you're being chased. And that's not a good feeling, especially as a rookie <laughs> pitcher. Right. But 
I think to your point, you know, and this is what I talk about now with clients, I kept my own journal, you know, back in the early 90s um, of, of my starts. I kept my own scouting report because I didn't care what, you know, Bryn Smith or Jose De Leon did against the, the Reds. I needed to know what my stuff was. So I, um, I wrote that down. I kept track of first pitch strikes, first pitch outs how many pitches I threw, how many, you know, I kept track of all this stuff. I had my own analytics and, um, and then I kept track of my inner voice, what was going on in the game. And I share these now with clients because I'll look back and say, you know, I was really honest, you know, I beat myself today. I, I, I got what I expected, which wasn't very good. Um, and so I share those. So I wrote all that down and, The thing that I share most, and you guys, uh, you read the book, was the little man. You know, Mm -hmm. I really learned how to control that inner voice. Um, And that was kind of trial and error. I had read stuff. Certainly Harvey Dorfman was was well published then um, and and later became a really good friend and mentor. But, you know, I learned how to, to deal with that voice instead of, trying to push it away. I was like, okay, I, I worked on that. Um, imagery was a very big part of my practice. And I got that from Norman Vincent Peel when I was a teenager, you know, because he, I remember you said, if you can see it and believe it, see it and believe it, you can achieve it. And this was back in the eighties. I used to do imagery in high school um, before games. Wow. And so that was a lot of stuff that was happening before, you know, this started to, to really come a hold in the last 10, 15 years. So yeah, I did a lot of that on my own. Um, And I think that that was the separator for me. You know, I had a below average fastball, average curveball, below average changeup, plus command, but it was the little things. And I think that, you know, my mindset helped me to achieve that 110 major league wins. I read an article where you said the athletes always say to you, I just wish I could stop thinking and just go perform. And you said, I just want you to think the right things. And you you made me think of that when you said about the little man, because that idea of thoughts become things. And and Mm -hmm. that's really, you know, I, I know in working with some of the players that I work with, I always say the biggest bully you'll probably face in your lifetime is the one that you see in the mirror. It's no question. You're, you're going to speak more critically of yourself and you can cut a little deeper than anybody else will ever be able to because of that intimate knowledge you have of yourself and you know, those weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that, um, that's so true. I've, I've often said to players, you know, okay, tell me what you're saying to yourself now. And they'll say, you know, you stink, you suck. You'll never get another hit. You're going to get sent down. I said, if somebody was in front of you telling you that to your face, what would you do? He goes, I'd punch them. Yeah, right. Right. So you wouldn't take it. And, um, and then the other, the other thing that we do is, you know, what would you tell? And Brandon, you get it. You know, now that you look back at your playing days, if you were, you know, still playing and, and had a, uh, a you know, maybe you did have a brother, but your son, you know, what would you tell your 13 year old son who's going through the same thing? You know, how would you talk to them? Your tone would be comforting and empathetic. You know, you would listen and you would say, look, just don't sweat it. Everything's going to be okay. You give them some reassurance. Right. So that's how we should talk to ourselves. We should have some self-compassion when we, but players don't because Mm -hmm. players beat themselves up. You know, I use the Jim Carrey liar liar scene where he goes in the bathroom and he puts his head on the toilet and he starts smashing the <laughs> toilet on <laughs> Brandon's laughing like crazy. That's right. And he goes, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm kicking my ass. Do you mind? <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's so uh, true. If we could only have it uh, that way, I, I think it's one of those things where, you know, you think about it is uh, baseball has become this major metrics game. You know, everything's about, you know, you've got the stat cast and spin rates and exit velocity and all these different things. But at the end of the day, it, it still comes down to that mental. That's the separator. I mean, it is the the thing that you just described, the Ozzy Smiths, the Lee Smiths, all of these great players you've played with. 
the, the, what separates them is that ability to get pitch to pitch better than other people. Well, and it's, and it's, the, and it's the Bob Tewksbury's. I mean, you can't pound the zone that way. If you get, if you get wound up over every bad pitch or every hit or every double, I mean, it's, it's to me. And then it was the reason I asked the question, your stats speak of your mental performance. You, mm. you can't just, you can't just pour it in, um, with that plus command, if, if you're still not right between the ears, I mean, it just, you know, I, I we've all seen no, you're, it. We've you're right. It. Yeah. Well, look at, you know, Maddox was, you know, yeah. I mean, tremendous. I used to tape his games as a scouting report because, you know, my ball didn't move as much as his. I didn't throw as hard, but I loved, we had the same week through strikes. And I right. think my whole philosophy was that, what with that and that started way back in high school is um you know to be aggressive by attacking the zone because brandon you're a hitter you don't like to be uncomfortable behind in the count and a guy that's right. attacking you with strikes is like wait a second now i gotta swing when you don't want to swing so uh so that yeah. became my strength and um i had some good mentors in high school my high school baseball coach uh i remember he told me one time you know, somebody should be able to take their cap and look at the little eye hole on the top of your cap, look through that cap and not know if you're winning or losing, you know, not see the scoreboard, not see anything else, right. just see your body language and say, I don't know if he's winning or losing. And that's what I tried to, to uh, exemplify on the mound. Yeah. Yes. So when you're working with players, Bob, and back, you know, kind of take you back a little bit to when you were every day working with some of the major league guys, I know you still have a lot of these guys and, uh, you know, that, that are, that employ you as far as your services go or help out from a consultation standpoint, but where did you usually begin? Where, what was it assess, you know, self-assessment, like what were building awareness? Where, where did you start with those guys? Um, well, I mean, when, when we start in the minor leagues, you, you it's all about relationship building. And in the minor leagues, I would have one-on-one sessions at the hotel with every player. I mean, I had hundreds of meetings in spring training, most of them at night, because I, I found that meeting the players at the ballpark wasn't productive. They're, when they get to the park, they're anxious. They want to do stuff. They get the hitting coach, pitching coach, catching coach, early work, extra work video work, strength and conditioning work, prehab and trainers. The last thing they want to do is come see me. So um, so you form those relationships with the players. And then, you know, we have sessions in spring training. Um, you know, we maybe once a week have a mental skills session. And, um, and then they seek you out. You know, there's no formal session. Um, you know, certainly the guys that I met at the hotel were all in rookie ball or you know, low A and, um, but as, as the players advance up, they become a little bit more, uh, protective. Um, but if you have a relationship with them from the minor leagues, it opens up and John Lester's a great example of that Mm -hmm. in the book, you know, um, help walking John through an imagery program, uh, in the manager's office at the Oakland Coliseum midway through 2013, um, was a game changer and he still uses that same audio now, which is yeah. amazing. Um, I love Bob. W- when you tell the Lester story as a coach, as a leader myself, I, the thing that really struck me and I hope that those that are coaches out there hear this is you said in there, you could tell he was ready. And that's so important that, you know, before trying to work with somebody and solve something, you got to see that they're, and that's part of that trust, but you got to see that they're open to it, that this is the right time to maybe push to do something like imagery, which you knew he wasn't going to be that comfortable with, but you could tell this was the time to maybe introduce that. Yeah. Well, I mean, in in working with the Cubs around Joe Madden, he was really close with uh, Kenny Revisa and Revisa always used to say, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Mm. And, um, and I thought that was really, uh, uh, powerful. And that's what happened that day with John. And, you know, it was, he came up to me in the dugout and, 
he's like, Hey, what do you got? And I'd known John, you know, for seven or eight years prior to that. And yeah, like in the, he was never really open to it. Um, and I, that's what I said. I think it's a quote is look, you know, one thing we haven't explored is this and let's do it. So, yeah, I mean, that, that is the ultimate, thing is is to be able to get that acceptance of true commitment from the player when they're ready not forced on them um that doesn't work and and i think you know that's why i would have a hard time now pitching in college with people calling my pitches yes. uh i would and if i had to look down at my wrist for a chart i i think uh. i'd yeah. Take it off and throw it away. I just don't get it. Uh, but that's another story. Um, yeah, we're on the same page there. I think the thing about that is feeling. That's what I that's what I get is this, you know, as players, we all have you you kind of tune into your feeling. And as a pitcher, especially, you got to feel comfortable with it. And that's one of the things you talked about with the Lester story is being in Oakland and how he just was not a place he ever felt comfortable. Did you have those fields? I'm sure where you just, no matter what, you just could not get comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. It was, you know, uh, the old Philly, the old vet at Philadelphia, um, was one of those. Um, and, and I think it's kind of related to, you know, your past experiences there, obviously, you know, at Bush stadium, you go to some places you feel totally confident. Um, I didn't particularly like pitching in Chicago as a cub because I stunk as a cub, <laughs> but when I got there as a Cardinal, it was a little bit better. You know, I listened to a podcast the other day on golf and I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he said something about confidence that I really think is really cool. And he said, confidence is all about managing your memories Um, because that's what it is. Athletes, you know, they choose to to filter out the good and focus on the bad, which doesn't help their confidence. And the good athletes, it goes all the way back to to the science of, you know, successful athletes focus on their successes more than their failures. So we have that choice to make. And. You know, I just thought that was a great way to talk about confidence is about managing, you know, your, your experiences. And um, yeah, I think, I think it's a, it's a really interesting point because it goes back to acting different than you feel. Um, And sometimes you can push yourself, you know, eventually you can, you will, you will feel as you're acting. If you, if you do that the right way, confidence is such a big thing that we hear from all of our guests. And I'm, I'm curious. And I thought about this question today is if you could wave a magic wand, you know, dealing with all these major league players and you had a chance to get somebody in their rookie year and you could give them one mental strength, whether, whatever that was confidence, awareness, whatever, do you, do you think there's something you saw over the years that would be that kind of, I know everyone's a little bit different, but there would be give them the best chance for success in their career. If they could, if you could just implant this one thing. Mm. Yeah. I, I think the thing that came to mind, John was managing expectations. Mm. Yep. Uh, I think, you know, I think players have oftentimes unrealistic expectations of what they think they should do, and they don't accept the fact of where they are and their constant misery because they're not performing to the level that they think they should. Uh, So that would be one thing. I think that's what comes to mind. Yeah, that's great. I wanted you to talk about something because – I think one of the things with minor league players, especially in your experience in dealing with them, this is why I love your resume as it relates to helping players uh, is because you've gone through that up and down from the majors to the minors. You went through the injury. So pretty much the gamut of things that you might experience as a mental skills coach, you were able to, to go, uh, go through as a player yourself. But one of the stories you tell in the book is when you talk about Ted Simmons talking to you prior to uh, the first start with the Cardinals. And he says, you're getting the ball on Saturday. If you do well, you'll get it again. If not, I'm not sure what will happen. And as you say in the book, he's not wrong. I mean, you had limited options at that point. You had already kind of exhausted most of the things. But I had it made me think of how hard it must be to fight that urge to be results focused all the time as a player when that is usually the predicament a lot of these guys find themselves in. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's the paradox of the sport is, 
you know, I mean, people say, how do I care without caring? Uh, right. You know, because ultimately you can't, you really can't care about your outcomes, but you have to care because it's your livelihood. Um, you know, yeah, I think I'll never forget that. And I really appreciate Ted for being an honest guy. And I'm glad he's in the Hall of Fame. He was a great catcher, really good man. Um, yeah, I mean, the results, I think, you know, that would probably be uh, a, a second thing along with what you, the question you just asked me that I said expectations. The other one would be controllables, you know. After the ball leaves the bat, you have no control over what happens. After the ball leaves your hand, you have no control over what happens. And you have to accept that um, and the ability to move past that. And so, you know, when he told me that, uh, I was scared shitless, to be honest, at the, yeah. when he first said it. But then I found a piece of, wow, this is, this is on me. So I went back to my preparation. You know, I prepared for that start, did my imagery. Uh, I was really confident going into that game. Um, and I I think I gave up three runs in the sixth inning or something, but Galarraga hit a home run. I ended up winning the game. <clears throat> and I pitched seven innings. <clears throat> excuse me. And I felt like, <clears throat> you know, that's going to get me the ball again. And then I pitched well again. So then I figured I had two mulligans after that. And um, <laughs> fortunately, I didn't need to use any of them. You, you know, it's interesting. Our guest last week, Mo Pickens, um, he he has a thing he uses with his golfers where he says, invite the challenge. And it sounds like that's exactly what you did is invite the challenge. You, it's, you seek the opportunity within that challenge. And Ted challenged you. And I think that, like you said, the difference is you found the peace in it and understood this is an, it could be an exciting thing or it could I could you know sit here and dwell on all of the things that could go wrong if I don't succeed in, well that uh, and, and the other thing John sorry to interrupt but the other thing no is um you know I think base the you know you guys played in college the the grind of a professional through the minor leagues to get to the big leagues is really really hard um you mm-hmm. sacrifice a lot uh, like anybody that achieves anything, doctors and lawyers, professions, you know, et cetera, you know, not to say that baseball is exclusive to anyone else achieving, but at some point there's in other industries and other professions, the person has a pretty good significant control over the outcomes of what happens in baseball. You can pitch your butt off and be stuck in triple a just because so when you got, finally get to a point where someone says, hey, you make it, you're in, you don't, you're out, there's a little relief with that because you don't, look, if I'm not going to make it, let me know now. I'll go right. home and get a job. I'll just get on with my life so that I don't have to keep banging my head against the wall here. So that's what I felt was my relief with that because, you know, I've been up and down six times. I had surgery on I won 13 games the year before in AAA, you know, 1990 started with a lockout. So I was in the big leagues for a short time, got sent back down and I was tired of it. Um, And so when that, when that opportunity came up to take, you know, it freed me, you know, it freed me. I love that. Brian Kane, who I know, you know, Brian, he talks about the, the, the moment you release the, uh, you know, the expectation, the thing that you're trying to achieve so, so much is the time when you're going to in, immediately increase your chances of getting it because well, it's no longer driving you so much. Yeah. Well, how many, you know, do you guys golf at all? Do you have any time mm-hmm. for golf? A little bit. How many times have you played your best on the front nine and with hopes and expectations on the back only to play worse on the back and it's because of that you're the expectations are focused on the result if i keep doing this oh my god i can yep and then the further the more you think about it the further it goes away until you're totally you go from euphoria of having a front 
to to I'm never playing this game again. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. No, you you just nailed it. I mean, that's exactly what happens to me every time I feel feel like I've gotten close to oh, if I can just par these next five holes, I'm going to shoot the best score ever. Hold on, and, Are, which yeah. would be what, John? If I just par the next five holes, it's I'll putt, break putt, right. right. It's tre- Treasure oh. Island, okay? It's Treasure <laughs> Island. <laughs> Is this putt putt golf? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yes. Yeah, if I can just get it through the windmill on this hole. <laughs> yes. Well, that's the part I was going to leave out. But hey, I want to ask you something because uh, in I, I keep saying in the book, but uh, it really is a good book. You guys have to to go out and get this book. Ninety percent mental. Uh, really, there's so many cool things about it. Bob does a great job uh, of both of you. Uh, of weaving your story within the lessons that you're wanting to convey within the book. But when you were talking about Andrew Miller, of course, the great relief pitcher, um, one of the things that I started thinking about was Cal Bailey, who's a legendary college baseball coach at West Virginia State University, um, since passed away, really great man. He used to talk about stress pitches, and he would say that stress pitches, when you're battling yourself out of an inning or you're getting out of you know bases loaded, jams, or whatever the case may be, these are pitches that should actually count twice towards a pitcher's pitch count because it takes so much out of you. And it got me thinking um, about this is when you're working with these guys, did you, um, did you, uh, do you look at relief pitchers differently or talk to them differently because they're, they have what I refer to as inherited stress, right? It's Mm -hmm. like they're, they're, they're coming in and it wasn't anything that they necessarily did, but now it's second and third. And, you know, it's a lot, maybe a lot easier as a, from a mental skills standpoint to. Yeah, I think um, that's a really good question. And he's a really good guy. I love Andrew. And there's a couple of things that come to mind with that uh, as I hated relieving, hated it. And, and I didn't come in with anyone on base. I was the long guy out of the bullpen, but I didn't like, for me, I didn't like having control over my preparation, you know, the phone ringing and, you know, I remember the first time the phone rang, I was in Kansas City. I, they put me in the bullpen, and I thought I was I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Um, uh, my heart just jumped through. They they pointed to you, too, because my heart just jumped out of my coat, like, oh, God. <laughs> um, but so they have to – they have to – the preparation's totally different. Um, you know, I've worked with, with a couple of really good – uh, relievers the last couple of years. And, you know, that the one thing we talk about is you don't pitch until you get on the mound, you know? Um, so don't start playing the game in your head until the phone rings to get loose. So you have all this time, you have pregame, you have batting practice, you have, you know, if, uh, you know, time before the game, then you have the, depending on your role, you might have six more innings, you know, it could be two more hours. So don't get ramped up too early but have a process to get ramped up knowing that when you might be called upon. And that's what Whitey Herzog was probably the best I ever saw at at managing a bullpen because people the the bullpen would know when they were going to go in and it, you know, they would just say, Hey, you're up. And there was a level of comfort and not a sense of craziness because Manny uh, Whitey just put people in a position to, to be successful. But but anyway, um, but for the for the guys that like Andrew coming in late in the game, you know, and Andrew's highly intelligent. He's a thinker, great competitor. Um, you know, managing that anxiety was something that we had to talk about. And again, I, I think it it goes to not turning it on until you have to turn it on. But then you have to turn it off. And I think. Um, especially if you have a bad game and you got to come, you're hoping to get back out there the next day. But what I say, you know, and one of the things that I think happens a lot, and it's my belief pet peeve of in managing uh, and you guys as baseball fans can attest to this, but how many times have you seen a reliever come in a bases loaded, no out situation, get out of the inning. You got to take him out, right? Mm-hmm. Take him out. Yep. His energy, his expert, his he's done. He's done. But they, he did his but, job. 
Yeah, but the man. What do the managers do? Well, you know what? They back he only out. threw twelve pitches, and if I can get him to go another inning, I'm saving the bullpen. He's done yeah. because mm-hmm. he got ramped up emotionally to go out and do his job. And when he's done, like my talk of the All Star Game, I was done. You know, mentally in the book, I talk about. You know, no one pitches two innings in the All Star Game that's not right. a starting pitcher. What right. the hell am I doing going back out there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so being, you know, so that emotional reserve, I, there is a much different uh, conversation with relievers than with starting pitchers. So, what? so along those lines, you talk about stress pitches and you had a, a pretty funny article. I think it was in SI talking about first pitches and, and, uh, presidents. <laughs> yeah, presidents oh yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and, and I mean, th- those those are those same folks have to kind of get geared up and they've got to I mean those are stressful pitches as well even especially as a non athlete because you don't you really don't have a process yeah I tell you what one of the most impressive which George Bush's at yeah. Yankee Stadium was damn that yeah. was impressive yeah and I know I forget what I said about Obama and I it, I, it I was love Obama but it was <laughs> it was. <laughs> It what, was so funny. There? Here's what you said. You said I wrote. I, I told Brandon today. So this, I was laughing so hard when I was reading this, and I'm I'm gonna give you kind of some uh, little excerpts from this because it was so funny. You said if he were pitching a game, the president would have committed no fewer than four or five balks before <laughs> throwing a pitch. It looks like his arm had been injected with Novocaine. It simply doesn't function. It's almost as if it's not even part of his body. <laughs> <laughs> but what was interesting, Bob, that, that Brandon says this about the stress pitches is Obama said that that was probably one of the most stressful moments of his entire right. presidency. Um, right? well, yeah. You know, I, <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love that article so much. It was so funny. Oh. Jimmy, you said about Jimmy Carter, he threw harder than you did. <laughs> It's so oh, great. great. Hey, oh. uh, speaking of managers, though, Bob, uh, so when we interviewed Dr. Mo last week, he was talking about how, you know, one of the things that as a sports psychologist on the PGA Tour, you can't be on the course during the uh, during the event. So a lot of times what he'll do is he goes over some keys or cues with the caddies um, of things to look for. Just be mm-hmm. mindful of this. This is something I'm working with the golfer on that type of thing. Did you as a mental skills coach in the majors, did you have things that maybe you would get aligned with the pitching coach on and because of the fact that, you know, you could say, Hey, I'm, I'm not going to be in the dugout necessarily, but if you see Lester going to this or speeding up his pace, or you see, you know, uh, Andrew Miller doing this, this is what, what's going on. Yeah. That's a really good question because the answer to that, they're twofold in the minor leagues. That's very much part of development. Um, in the big leagues, uh, that happened rarely um, because sometimes, you know, the player doesn't want anyone to know they're talking to anybody. It's true. So you can't double coach. Um, but in the minor leagues, it was very common practice to talk to the pitching coach, uh, especially because, you know, they're the boots on the ground. I would go into Greenville and see the, the A ball team and talk with Bob Kipper um, and say, you know, these are the guys, these are some things I'm think, you know, that I'm working on, uh, taking a breath, blah, 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 you know, journaling. And um, uh, so, yeah, very much so because you have to have that collaboration, especially as a developmental tool with the, the younger player. Yeah. Do you have any mentors in mental performance when you first started getting into it? I mean, I know you've mentioned Ken Revisa a couple of times. Uh, yeah, Kenny and, and Harvey Dorfman. Yeah. Uh, you know, I met, uh, and, and later Charlie Marr, who's been in Cleveland and for a long time and, uh, Charlie and Kenny and, and Harvey, I think kind of came into baseball around the same time, probably mid eighties. Um, and, you know, Harvey published three great books. Ken wrote heads up baseball and, and Charlie has some books out. Charlie's the only really psychologist, um, 
uh, I mean, clinical psych. He has a license. Ken was a sports psychologist, but Harvey, uh, Harvey didn't have a, he had a, I don't think he had a PhD, he had a master's degree, but he, um, he had a way about him that was just incredible. It helped so many people. Um, so all of those, you know, people help, help me along the way. And I try to do that now with other people. I have, you know, students email me and talk to me. I have professionals in the field that may run stuff by me. I've kind of taken on that role and in honor of them, um, uh, because they did it for me. And I think we have to, you know, pay it forward. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, a lot of the things that you talk about um, that you share throughout the book, you know, the symptom and the mental cue, so to speak, the breathing, the positive self-talk, the uh, awareness, all of the, you know, focusing on the task at hand. I mean, these are things that what I like as we've started to talk to more and more people who are in this field like yourself is it's it's we're starting to see this momentum and you've been, you were right there at the forefront of it coming as a player into the field uh, into the field of mental performance coaching. But I mean, you really have seen a shift in this paradigm to where, to your point, maybe some of the major league guys don't necessarily want everyone knowing they're talking to a mental skills guy, but maybe it's that performance coach. You know, I, we had somebody say to us that they don't even announce themselves as a mental skills coach. They say, I'm a performance coach just because for whatever reason, the players yeah. tend to be better with that. Yeah. That's, that's, I've always struggled with, you know, what am I, who am I? Um, you know, I'd like to say that, yeah, performance coach, um, you know, I hate performance enhancement coach, uh, but, um, you know, mental skills coach people, it's just, very um very weird of the perception of that uh but i do think that um i remember harvey saying one time to uh to the front office he said he told dave now who was it um the gm for the uh a's back then i can't remember but la Russa was managing and um and harvey told this he said never never talk to me in front of the players um, because he knew that that would form a perception mm. and, um, and, and it did. I mean, I, I had one of my biggest, uh, toughest moments in this field was when a player said that he didn't trust me. Uh, and the reason he didn't trust me is because we had a conversation in the outfield. And then I went into the clubhouse and into the manager's office about something totally unrelated, but he saw me go in there. Uh, and it, it broke our relationship and, um, and it wasn't true. So, um, I, I lost the original, I wouldn't be a good politician because if you ask me multiple questions, there's no <laughs> chance I'm going to answer both of them. So I, 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 I forgot think you the original it. question. Well, the original question was just that stigma, right? It start. you've seen it. Shift. Oh yeah. It's, it's starting to the come shift, back around. Yes. Um, you know, yeah. And when, when, when I broke in, you didn't talk about it. Um, I think fortunately it's the players are learning this now through minor leagues. They're coming up with part of it. A lot of colleges have, uh, professionals in this area. It's becoming more of the norm. Um, I do think that, um, I, I do think that having, after having, you know, Harvey told me that my playing experience would be a blessing and a curse. Hmm. And I didn't know what he meant. I'm like, what are you talking about? How can it be a curse? You know, I know everything they're going through. But he was right, because what happens is oftentimes early on, and even still occasionally, I'll revert back to the former player brain of the experience instead of the mental skills coach mm -hmm. brain. So, and that's what I think a lot of coaches fall into a trap of sharing their own experiences, which are great and valid, but they're biased. They're one, right. you know, and they may not help the person that has a need. And so, um, you know, the field has grown. It's going to continue to grow. Um, I, I do think, you know, everyone's, the teams are looking for a competitive advantage. It started with strength and conditioning when I first came up. Mm -hmm. Everyone had to have that. Now everyone has it at multiple levels. Then it went into nutrition, GNC, 
they probably get a little overboard going the other way, but you know, <laughs> it, it's come back to where, you know, diet is important and supplements, good supplements are important. Um, and now it's this part. Um, and I'll be honest, you know, I think it's much easier and more rewarding to work in the minor leagues than it is in the big leagues. Because in the minor leagues, you have people that are trying to get to the big leagues that are sponges that will will listen. Uh, you can grab players anytime. The coaches are receptive to um, it, uh, to that intervention, at least with me. Uh, when I get to the big league level, um, players are more closed off. It's, it's harder to get a conversation with them. Uh, for me, uh, it was harder to talk to coaches because they have their own experiences and who am I, another player coming to talk to them. Uh, so, so, but you have that currency too, as that player, that former player. So that helps a lot with those, those young players. Cause that's what helps a lot with the young yeah. players and the respect of that for sure. Yeah. Um, but you still have to get in and form relationships. And, you know, like I said, it gets me in the door, but it doesn't keep me in the house. Building right. a relationship with somebody, knowing that you care about them is what keeps you there. And there's a lot of really good people out there doing that work now that care about their players and, and are having successful uh, work done with them. Yeah. No, I, I think it's outstanding. So Bob, let's talk uh, as we close up here, just about what people can find at bobtooksbury.com. I know you're doing mental skills, coaching sessions, you do speaking engagements, you work from everywhere from the 12 year old or 13 year old, all the way up to college players, college teams. What else can people find there? Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. The website is, um, I've had for a while, there's a couple of audio programs on there, fundamental keys to hitting and pitching. They're basically mirroring. uh, So if you're really a hitter, you should get the hitters one. If you're really a pitcher, uh, I know a lot of youth parents are buying both because their child does both, but they're basically a mirroring effect. Um, um, But yeah, I mean, I've, you know, it can reach me via email on the website. Um, I usually, you know, I, I vet a lot of the work. I want to make sure that the, the, if it's a younger player, if they're, um, you know, able to grasp what's going on. Um, if they're a college player, if they're engaged in following up, because most of the time their parents are paying for this resource. So I, I want to make sure that they're vested in this. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my mission like it's to help athletes find their path to success. And, um, and, uh, I really enjoy connecting with people in that way. And, um, yeah, I have some, I've had some wonderful interventions and clients and I've, you know, um, suffered with them and their injuries and their setbacks. And that's what makes this fun because when they get on the other side of it, as you guys know, as coaches, when you see the struggle and you see them come on the other side, you know how good it feels because you've been there yourself. And, yeah, uh, you know, but I, I often, you know, you guys are both parents and I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever had a day where my son came up to me and goes, dad, you did a hell of a job parenting today. Nice job. <laughs> you know what? God, that was awesome. You know, and, and so that's the same work that we do in mental skills is no one comes up to you yeah. and says, God, that was great. But over a course of time, they know you've made an effect on them yeah. uh, or had an effect on them. So a lot behind the scenes, but very rewarding. Absolutely right. So it's Bob Tewksbury, uh, B-O-B-T-E-W-K-S-B-U-R-Y.com for those of you who uh, want to find Bob on the web. Um, lots of really cool stuff on here. Control the inner voice, implement imagery practice, teach relaxation. Guys, we talked about this a couple of shows ago that as parents, you are the first mental skills coaches. You can help teach young people people self-awareness that could be your number one task and if you can help them just debrief on their day and do things like that you're going to be that much further ahead of the game uh for folks like bob who are out there helping everybody um lots of really cool stuff 
we really uh, thank you a lot. Oh, one other thing that's on that website is Disc for Athletes, which is oh, really, yeah. uh, I mean, I've done that from the business world and it's really cool. And if, if people uh, get a chance, they should definitely check that out. Yeah, I'm glad, you know. I'm glad that you brought that up, John, because that's, you know, I think one of the things that has to happen uh, is is overall to get an assessment of where the the athlete is and you know it's not for the 12 year old but for 15 on up I, I use it with my clients and it's really helpful to understand someone's behaviors for them to understand their own behaviors and to try to work to change behavior because ultimately you can change behavior uh, and it's not a personality test it's validated a uh, great company out of Australia. And, um, you know, I just had a conversation today with a dad of a high school player about the disc and the behaviors um, and how he can, he wants to know how he can help his son based on that information, just what you just said to be the boots on the ground there to, to work with that. So uh, I do that often with parents Um and yeah, the disc is really good. And yeah, the, all my, my contact info is there by email. And, you know, I have some blogs. I've, I've got to write another one um, on there as well. And, and um, yeah, happy to, you know, especially with Zoom, happy to do group sessions with teams. I, I've, I love uh, question and answers with players and parents and so yeah, I really, guys, this has been so fun. It's uh, a great. It was. It was as I thought it would be. A very entertaining, very informative. I, I definitely am going to pick your brain at another time about disc for athletes because I'm going to u- start using it with some of the college teams I work with as well because I well, think I've seen the value in those in the past. Uh, we we appreciate you coming on and and paying it forward uh, the way that uh, your mentors did. So we yeah. really appreciate that. Yeah. Awesome, guys. Well, Thanks. you take care of yourself. Stay you safe. All and, right, Bob. Uh, awesome. Thank you, Bob. Take care. We'll talk Appreciate to you it. soon. Take care. Right, soon. Bye, guys. Right, bye-bye. Want to provide feedback or stay up to date with the show? Visit our Instagram page at Mental Advantage Podcast. Or you can send us an email at podcast at mentaladvantage.net. To have John Cullen work with you or your team, please write to him at john.cullen at mentaladvantage.net. Thanks for listening to today's episode.